So our next speaker is uh, John Bruce. He is a survivor of head and neck cancer, and I'm not going to share anything else because he's going to come up and share his story and how sort of his journey with cancer has included some aspects of isolation and how that he's dealt with that. So come on up, John. Thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, yes, uh, isolation, cancer, and me. As you can see by the tree, uh, that's sometimes how you feel. A friend of mine, um, a couple of years into my journey with cancer, uh, I, I wanted this particular tree, and he found it, and he said it reminded him of me. What he said was, it is a lone tree growing out of a rock outcrop with grassland all around it. As you can see, it is weathered and broken, and yet it survives. How, I don't know. He saw the tree a few months ago and thought of me. So yes, I'm weathered and broken, yet I survive. So I consider myself a survivor, but yet isolated out in the middle of, of, the, of the fields there. So my story, I consider myself special. I'm a cancer of the head and neck individual. Um, I'm lucky to have had it in Edmonton rather than anywhere else because uh, our doctors in uh, the U of A developed systems to really make life better for a head and neck patient. Uh, surgery was 17 hours. Um, chemotherapy was the worst thing in my life. Radiation, 30 reps of radiation. And then one year later, I ended up with strep A bloodborne and had to just about start all of my battles with voice and swallowing all over again. Why isolation? Oh, uncertainty. You, you look, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where you're going to be. You feel hopeless. Um, I look different. I sound different. Everything changes physically in me. I'm not the same person I was. You perceive facts. Sometimes the internet can be a good thing. Sometimes it can be a bad thing. When you're feeling down and you decide to research your situation, sometimes it can get downright depressing and, and make you anxious. It can drive you down into a bad place where all you want to do is you want to hide away from everything and everybody. Um, what did I do? Well, this picture here, this is me sitting in my room in the basement. It's just a small little bedroom in the basement. Alone, I spent hours in there. Um, I had medication, uh, so I was on morphine. I was also on, now I'm on depress antidepressants and such. But it just, I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to do anything. I, I had a low self-worth. I just spiraled down and down. I didn't, I didn't take any helping hands. I had many ask me, uh, could we put you on some medications or there's this program here or there's this program here. I, I guess maybe I was in a bit of denial over everything. I didn't want any help. I just wanted to get back to normal, which all that did was depress me further and, uh, and I'd just go into a hole. I ended up rushing back to work and I buried myself in my work. Six months after I had 17 hours of surgery, 30 doses of radiation and chemo that almost killed me, lost my voice, had to learn how to speak, had to learn how to swallow food. I was back at my job, getting ready to fight fire six months after the fact full time. 
I didn't socialize with anybody. I lacked self-worth. I just did my job and I went home. Lunch for me was a chore. Eating was a chore. It took me an hour to eat, so I couldn't talk while I ate. I just sat there and chewed and chewed and chewed. I'd chew for three to four hours a day, and I'd soak a lot. So because I soaked a lot, I was very self-conscious about eating around people. So I'd go back into my office, or I'd just further isolate myself. I'd close the door. I didn't want people to see me in that state. And I was going through uh, separation and divorce at the time, so I just forecasted a life alone. I didn't think anything would change. Why care? Why fight? Well, I've got three reasons. My children. You know, I, all I had to do was look at them and I went, time to get off your butt. So how did I turn it around? There's tools to turn around. Get moving. Every day I forced myself. I'd get up. I'd push myself along the edge of the bed. And I'd just sort of fall off the bed. And then that would make me have to stand up. Once I stood up, I could start to move. I'd go up the stairs. i keep moving around. I'd go for a walk. I'd go out to the end of the sidewalk and back, and then I went to the end of the block, and then on and on and on. I just made myself move. I got out of that room, which I'd made my own little safe cocoon and prison in, and I made myself move. I became responsible for me. It's one thing to go and isolate yourself but after a while, the only person you have to blame for the isolation is you. You can choose to be happy, or you can choose to be poor me in that little room, in that little space, all by yourself. You, know, you push everybody and everything away from you, so the only way you can get out of that is to make up your mind that you're going to be responsible for your own happiness, and, and reach out. When you do ask and accept help, though, you have to do the work. And that's one thing, work. It, there is a lot of work involved. It takes work to push yourself off of that bed and move to the side of the room. It takes work to drag yourself up the stairs. It takes work to eat that meal. It takes work to go out and say hi to somebody. It takes work to do your normal work, but all of these care providers that are trying to help you are giving you the tools to make you a success. Talking, for me, takes work. Some words, like, like uh, ugly, I can barely say, but I continue to work at them. Speaking in front of a crowd, that was a massive thing the first time I did it after I learned how to speak again. I was so nervous, but I did the work. I continued with the exercises and the practice they gave me, and I, and I pushed myself out into the crowd. How am I doing it still? Humor. I got to allow myself to laugh now and again, and not take myself too seriously. I'm only here to live. Exercise, I don't beat myself up. When I'm too tired, I don't do it. And sometimes I go into a rut where I don't do it, but then after a while, time comes along, some prodding from my loved ones, I start to get mobilized again. I start to maybe feel good for a day or so. And when that opportunity hits, I get out there and I do it. Diet. Eating just worked for me, so I maximize the value of it. Sure, I still love a dessert or a sweet or something, but a lot 
just because of the makeup of them, I can't swallow anymore. So I try and make it like chocolate almonds. It's weird. An almond to itself is like peanut butter in my mouth. And when you don't have saliva, it's like eating a bunch of crackers without water. But with the chocolate, it just sort of melts and slides down. And it's very enjoyable. You've got to take some enjoyment out of life and maximize the energy you put into it. How am I doing it? Well, I'm letting people in. I went through, I was in a separation when I got sick. I'm moving into a divorce. I forecasted a life of loneliness. Nobody's going to love me. Who would want to spend time with me? I'm a victim of cancer. I have the plague. I am worthless. I'm just going to get sick and die. Who's going to want to... Why would I want to burden myself on someone else? Finally, I, let, I started feeling decent about myself and feeling happy, and I let somebody in. And I'm glad, because now I'm sharing my life with somebody I love. Asking for help takes strength. I'm really strong. It took me a long time to realize that asking for help doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're very strong. It means you've let your pride go and you're willing to say, I need a hand and accept that hand. I wasn't raised to ask for a hand. That was always a sign of weakness. But now I feel it's the strongest thing I could ever do. People are there, they want to help. Allowing them to help makes them feel like they have purpose. And it, it allows me to get better and enjoy life more. So, so when, I, when I'm starting to feel like I'm going downhill, I reach up. I've accepted new limitations and now I'm looking for new opportunities. My career as I know it in the past is done. It will never be the same again. A lot of my life is done. It took me almost four years to accept that. Now I've accepted it, now I'm moving on. I'm looking for new opportunities. One of them is talking to you today. I wrote, wrote I wrote it out of me. I wrote a book last, last year. I dealt with all of the physical, but I never dealt with the mental. And I just had to get it out of my system. A therapist told me, try writing it out. I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. I started writing. She said, you have a good story that others could benefit from. So I came up with my book. It was very therapeutic. It just sort of went blah. It just fell out of me. In three and a half months, I wrote a book. And to a lot of people that write books or are trying to write books, that's an amazing feat. Good things can come from bad times. I had cancer. I almost died. But those are bad. My career is gone. That's bad. Many things along the way, physical things, I have limited limitations to now. Those are bad. But the good things are is that I feel more. I'm learning to live. I'm still young. I still have a large portion of my life ahead of me. I still have things to live for. I'm still a value and I'm slowly picking up purpose in my life again. Drop me a line sometime. This is my email address. I love to hear from people. I love to talk to people. When I talk to people, it's therapeutic for me. It makes me feel good because I'm voicing how I'm feeling. When I hear their stories, I can relate to them. 
we both help each other because we're not alone. You know, I still have bad days. I'm always going to have bad days. Some days I'm walking along and I just hit a wall. And it's like, boom, fatigue, time to shut her down. Other days, I'm just like bouncing off the walls. I'm, I'm ready to go at anything. I have to learn how to, I guess, level all that out and live, live to what is best for me. Big thing, though, is that I know if I reach out, there's a hand there I can grab. And that is one of the biggest things about the isolation, again, is when I'm feeling weak, when I need a helping hand, if I don't voice that I need the helping hand and reach out, I'm going to stay in that little hole of isolation. I'll never move forward or never climb out. But if I just reach out, somebody's going to grab hold and help me up.